Good morning. Look, I know we've already done the piece, but just because we're a friendly bunch, just once again, just turn round to someone sitting near you and just say good morning, hello, smile at them for a moment. Brilliant. Oh, what a friendly bunch we are. Well, yes, good morning. So my name's Chris. I'm um, part of the church here, member of the church here, and, and in my day job, I work with young people for Youthscape. Um, Helen's not here this morning. We've got um, actually quite a few people visiting. Um, she's got her sister, uh, Rachel, up, and her cousin, Becky, because her cousin, Becky, this is relevant to this morning, is... Uh, getting married in August this year. So it's a conflab all weekend of wedding dresses and bridesmaids outfits. And I've got to tell you, and I'm upset about this, I, I have not been massively consulted <laughs> in this process. It turns out they don't particularly believe I have much to bring on that. I just say black jumpers. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, that's, that's what they're doing. So, John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana. And let's just start with this story as it comes to us. Jesus at a party, drinking alcohol, get over it, having fun with his friends and family. And I just say that I'm going to we're going to lean into some metaphor. We're going to find some meaning in this story. But actually, I just think the first thing to do with this story is just let it be what it is. And I think in some ways challenge some of the assumptions and stereotypes we have of Jesus. But he spent a lot of time eating, sharing, hanging out with people, socializing. The Gospels are full of it. And here it is, too. The other thing, I think, just before we get into this, is to maybe be curious as to why John tells us this story. At the very end of John, the last bit of John, he says, uh, I don't really remember this, he says, gosh, Jesus did so many other things that even if uh, I filled all, even if there were books that filled the whole world, he hadn't obviously come across the Kindle at this point, but even if there were books that filled the whole world, there would not be enough of them to tell all the stories of everything Jesus said and did. In other words, of course, Jesus, there were hundreds, thousands of moments of stories Jesus told, of miracles, of moments in Jesus' life. And we just get a fraction of them in the Gospels. And in John, we get even fewer because, remember, he spends pretty much half his Gospel talking about the last few weeks of Jesus' life. So there were very few stories he chooses to include, but he includes this one. So we should perhaps be curious. This isn't a coincidence, I suspect. John has a purpose in this story. And of course, the other thing to remember is that um, we're reading a translation and sometimes, and I think it's true in this story, some of the language lands quite clunkily. So remember, they're talking in Aramaic. It gets written down in Greek, Koine Common Greek, and then it got translated into English. And there's plenty of opportunity in that process for the nuance to get lost. So if I, age 30, had turned around and said to my mum, woman, I would have got a clip round the ear even at 30. So there's, there's just a little bit of nuance there that we're not going to have time to go into that, but it's there. And the other thing to remember is, even though this is a story about a wedding, don't for a moment imagine that you know much about this story. Because, yeah, of course, we've all been to weddings, probably loads of weddings. So there's a sense in which you come to this, and like, yeah, I, 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 this is territory I'm familiar with. This is a wedding. No, this is a wedding from 2,000 years ago in a completely different culture. 
So there's a little bit of work we have to do to kind of understand what weddings looked and felt like at the time of Jesus in, in Palestine. And they were very different. For a start, you didn't get to choose to get married. The two fathers in families would make the decision that you, they were going to join their families and that the bride and bridegroom were going to marry each other. They would signify that with a glass of wine that they shared together, and that was the engagement. And by the way, at that point, the wedding, the marriage was fixed. If you wanted to get out of an engagement, you needed a divorce. You had to be divorced from an engagement as well as a wedding, as, as well as marriage. And then what would happen once this ceremony had taken place is that the bridegroom, the, the, the bloke, would head off to spend some time building the home in which they were going to live. And this was normally not, unless they were very rich, this wouldn't have been a separate house. This would have probably been an extension onto the family home. And they would spend, what, maybe six or 12 months doing that. The woman, the bride, would spend that time preparing everything that was needed for the new home. When all of that was ready, on a prescribed day, normally in the evening, so it's dark, the bridegroom, the guy, would get all his mates together. Everyone knew this was happening because it's a small village, so people know it's the day. Get all its mates together. They would go down to the bride's family house. They would knock on the door, and the bride would be there with all her mates um, waiting for the bridegroom. By the way, Jesus tells some other parables that lean into this moment. You, you remember the ten virgins waiting. This is all connected with this, but they're waiting there. The bride and, and her mates then join the bridegroom and his mates. Obviously, they didn't call it mates. I'm just sort of colloquializing that. And they head back up to the family home of the bridegroom, and they have a massive party. And the party lasts seven days. There's no more ceremony. There's no do you take or anything like that. That They knew how to do this. The party is the wedding. The only other thing they would do is at the beginning of that process, the bride and bridegroom would head off to consummate the marriage. This does not normally happen in a wedding these days. You don't have someone saying, by the way, Derek and Julie are just popping off. Welcome to the reception. Derek and Julie are just popping off to consummate the marriage. They'll be back in a jiffy. That's not how it rolls. <laughs> At least not in any of the weddings I've been to. So for the bridegroom's family, this would be the biggest moment in their lives. The whole village is there. Their son is getting married. It's huge. And remember that in this culture, hospitality is absolutely fundamental. It's an obligation. And so there's a huge pressure on the bridegroom's family. They will have been preparing and dreaming of this moment. This is perhaps the biggest moment of their lives. And that hospitality runs deep. I remember some years ago, I was in Ramallah on the West Bank with some people, and we were going to a house there, a wonderful Palestinian family, unannounced to deliver something. We got there. As we got there and were greeted, immediately the wife sent her two children off to the market to buy some food to bring back, to prepare, to feed us a meal so that you do not pop round just for a few minutes in this culture, okay? So we were there for about two and a half, three hours because I had to go shopping, get the food, cook it, and serve it and eat. That's the kind of culture of hospitality that is still true in many parts of the world today. When I was much younger, in my 20s, I went traveling with one of my uni friends in Indonesia, my friend John Otit. By the way, isn't that the best surname that you can possibly have? He had two children, Jill and Will. Just Have you got there? And uh, we were in the middle of nowhere in the Dieng Plateau in Indonesia, walking through. And we came to a village literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, 
and uh, they were in the middle of a wedding. On arrival, because we were guests, we were made guests of honor at this wedding. In fact, I've got some pictures of me looking a little younger in my 20s, and we're on these sort of throne-like chairs, the two of us scruffy backpackers, um, and we are guests of, we were made guests of honor at this wedding, and then we slept the night at the village. We couldn't get out. So hospitality is absolutely fundamental, and to fail in that duty would be utter shame and humiliation for the family. The stakes, I want you to understand, this isn't like saying, oops, we've run out of ice, can you pop to the co-op? The stakes are high in this culture. So to run out of wine um, would have been an absolute disaster um, and would have brought huge shame upon that family, lifelong shame. No one would forget that that is what you did as a family. In a sense, this story is as much about, if it's about anything, it's about Jesus rescuing a family from shame. That's what's going on here. Because shame, that sense of humiliation, is such a destructive emotion. It really is, isn't it? I was just thinking with someone a couple of weeks ago about my school life, junior and secondary, and thinking back. And, you know, however many years that was, all of primary school, all of secondary school, the first thing, in fact, pretty much the only thing I can think of from those moments was when I was in year four and I was humiliated by a teacher in front of a class. And I remember that feeling of shame. 50 years ago, literally 50 years ago, the first thing I think of, that's the memory that burns through. I remember sitting with a wonderful teenager who uh, is not a teenager anymore, but when they were growing up in Luton in the late 80s, there was a milk float that went around the little close where she lived. And uh, she went to get on the back because sometimes the youngsters would get rides on the back. And the Milkman said, you can't get on here. You're too big and heavy. I'm not going to let you on. And as a little kid at junior school, she felt the shame of that moment. And that shame defined her life in really profound and difficult ways. So she, her battle with her body image, her battle with food, lived out of one moment of shame with that man in that street that day. He probably had no idea what he had done. So this is a family on the brink of disaster and shame. And this is what Jesus does. He comes and he rescues us from our shame. This is the work, isn't it, of what God is doing in us, redeeming us, bringing us hope. Jesus rescues us from shame. All of us sitting, I'm sure, in memories and moments of shame that to some extent have defined who we are. But Jesus rescues us. So he sends the servants to fill up the six jars. And I'm curious here because in a way, there's something going on because it would have made much more sense for him to send them with the empty wine casks because they've drunk the wine. So the stuff the wine came in is empty. But he doesn't do that. He sends them to use these huge empty uh, ceremonial washing jugs, and they are enormous. And they have two purposes. You wash your feet and you wash the dead. That's what they're used for. They're used for when you wash the dead too. Um, And of course, we'll come back to the meaning in that. But of course, they come back. I'm rushing through the story here. And they are wine. But they are not just wine. This isn't. This isn't your £4.50, is it? I don't know. When when you buy a bottle of wine, where do you go? Are you you down at the £4.50 mark? Or are you at the 7 Some people nodding. £7.50? £8.50? Have I lost you? £12? Not on your life! Oh, I see some nodding here. Noted for pastoral work later. (sighs) So it becomes It becomes wine. And this is, this, this is the Jesus 
I just want you to notice, here is Jesus in the everyday. This is Jesus just in the midst of a family's wedding. And this is where Jesus does his ministry. Yes, he's at the synagogue, but rarely. The work of Jesus is in the ordinary and everyday. It's loaves and fishes. It's mud and spit. It's water and wine. This is where Jesus is. This is what he's transforming. And this is where he is in our lives. He's here today, but his work, really, this is a minor part of his work. His work is with us in the everyday. It's in the kitchen. It's in the funeral and the wedding and the hospital visit and the family get together and the workplace. This is Jesus in the everyday. So I've only got a few minutes, and uh, John would be very annoyed with me if I didn't try and get some metaphorical meaning out of this story, because I think John is a frustrated poet. Uh, he loves metaphor and image and meaning, and his, his book is full of it. Remember, the very first chapter of John, we have light, the word, darkness, lots of glorious, deep, profound images. So... Uh, so he brings us into this story, and I wonder what he's trying to tell us. So let's just go on a quick journey that would make John happy for a moment and think about this story. So Jesus is taking this water that is used for the washing of the dead, where it is empty and it is broken. There is the possibility of shame, and he is bringing out of it the most glorious wine. And remember, wine in the Old Testament is a symbol of the kingdom, of new hope, and particularly of healing, the healing that the kingdom brings. I've had for the last two days, fortunately I haven't made you sing it, a 1981 Graham Kendrick song. I'm going to test your knowledge here. One shall tell another. Do you remember this song? And he shall tell his friend, husbands, wives, and children. Are you ready for that? And what's the, what's the chorus? No? 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 You Come on in and taste the new wine. Do you remember this? The wine of the... Oh, thanks for letting me die on the spot. <laughs> Hanging me out to dry. Come on in and... Yeah. Do you not... Re All right. I'm wasting my time. I can see that. Come on in and taste the new wine. The, wi the, the wine is a powerful symbol of the kingdom, of hope, of redemption, of healing. So death and brokenness and emptiness, life and kingdom and healing. Now, there's another little bit of detail that John just drops in. I wonder why it is. When does all of this take place? Anybody remember? When, when, right at the beginning of this story, we get this weird detail that he gives us. Why does he tell us this? The third day. Hang on a minute. Can you just come with me? What else do we know in Scripture that takes us from death and brokenness into life and the kingdom on the third day? Are you, are you with me? Yeah, look, John is excited with us. We've got it. Because in a sense, what I think John is saying, this is, this is why I think. John chooses this story. Because in a way, in this story is the picture of the whole of Jesus and what he's come to do. He takes what is empty and broken and for the dead, and he transfers it and transports it into the finest wine, the presence of the kingdom. It is the story of his story. And that's why John tells us it, because he's a frustrated poet, and he sees meaning in it, and he puts it right at the beginning of his story, of his book, because it's as though this introduces us. In this one story, in this moment, we see everything about who Jesus is and why he's come. Wait, there's, there's one more thing. Jesus doesn't turn the water into wine. Did you notice that? So I haven't become a heretic. Stay calm. Jesus doesn't turn. It's not like a magician, is it? He doesn't do, he doesn't say, ladies and gentlemen, here's the water. Quick, taste it. Yes, it's water. Right, taste it again. It's wine. Everybody, I've done it. He doesn't do that. The kingdom is coming, but who, this is, I'm turning this into a class now. 
Who are the people who have to do the work? The servants. Oh, John is going to be very pleased with us this morning. The servants are those that do the work. Mary, the lo- this is the last words of Mary that we're given in all the Gospels. She just says this, wise words, do whatever he tells you. That's her instructions to the servants. Do whatever he tells you. So it's the servants who do the work. I know Jesus is doing the miracle. I'm not committing heresy here. It's okay. But the servants, and they, they you know, this is, there's not a tap somewhere for this. If they're going to go and fill these jugs, which are in these urns, which are enormous, they have to go to the well in the village and fill it up and bring it back. This is like, a, this is proper work. And, and the, the amount of wine they're producing, by the way, just so you've got this in your mind, it approximates, I think, to around 600 bottles of wine that they're making. Right? This is, by the way, Jesus was serious about parties, wasn't he? I mean, he really wants us to party. Right? 600 bottles of wine. I've not been to a wedding where they've served that up yet. So, um, so there's, there's something profound here. Can you see what John is telling us? I'm, this is the metaphor here. Because we... We, in a sense, John is, is leaning into telling us this is the work of the church. We are bringing God's kingdom. It, God, it's God's kingdom. It's his glory. But we are those that are tasked with it. And it's hard work serving God, isn't it? It's hard work going to get the water from the well and putting it down and bringing it up and taking it back. It is hard work in the church doing the work of the kingdom. It is, it is difficult work. It is often challenging, but it is the work of the kingdom, the care of the elderly, the moment of love and recognition, the provision of hospitality, the sharing of faith and the Bible. These simple things that we do, we are the servants collecting the water from the well that Jesus turns into wine. This summer, last summer, Um, Youthscape held our first big summer festival. So this is a space to which young people from all over the UK are invited to come for a week in the exotic setting of a showground in Peterborough. We know how to party. On perhaps the hottest week of the year. Do you remember that in August? Not, there was no, there was yellow grass Not the most ideal circumstances for camping, let me tell you that right now. Um, 2,000 young people gathered together, 350 of us as volunteer adults helping make that happen. My job was making coffee for youth leaders in the little youth leader lounge. I've made coffee all week. But there were others on the security gate and organizing the electrical hookups and managing various venues and stopping kids trying to skateboard off inappropriate bits of the surroundings and all the other things, 350 of us, and we were doing the work of the kingdom. And 250 young people or so stood up over that week and gave their lives to Jesus for the first time. It was the kingdom. And well over 300 stood up and said, I've lost it. I want it back. I want to do it. So the kingdom came, but it was hard work. We were lugging a jar to the well and filling it with water. So what I wonder is God asking of you? Let's pray together. Lord, this story that John gives us is rich and deep and beautiful. And in a moment, a very human moment of a wedding, we see not only your love of people, and your presence with them, but a wonderful story of who you ultimately are and what you are doing and our place in that world. So we thank you for this story that John gives us, and we pray it may land in our lives this morning in a way that brings hope and challenge. Amen.